There's also a phenomenon called use-dependent recovery, where the areas of the brain that are most active while awake are then the ones that have the most slow wave activity in the next sleep opportunity. So that could be sensory motor. For example, if you stimulate one part of the body or move it around a lot, then the associated sensory and motor neurons in the brain will have more slow wave sleep than the non-stimulated parts. And then likewise, if you force one part of the body to be still, that would mimic, for example, your arm being in a sling, then there would be less slow wave activity in the associated areas of the brain than otherwise. And so that's thought to show that muscle atrophy from non-use, while part of it has to do with actual muscle tissue shrinking, part of it is actually a neurological non-use kind of decay. But use-dependent recovery can also be cognitive, where it's linked directly to learning. And more generally, the more energy that your brain or a part of your brain uses, the more subsequent slow-wave sleep there is. This diagrams from a paper exploring the idea that the enhancement of slow-wave sleep might be used therapeutically to improve cognition. So they identified several ways that we can increase slow-wave sleep that would be candidates for this kind of experiment, and one of them is by increasing energy use in the brain. So we now have the foundation of our map. Adequate slow wave sleep can preserve cogn cognitive function and glucose tolerance. And one of the things that contributes to slow wave sleep is energy use in the brain. A whole other aspect of sleep is the circadian aspect. Circadian effects are biological patterns that change with the cycle of light and dark. So this graph, for example, shows how cortisol releases circadian. It peaks just after waking, it drops throughout the day, and reaches its lowest point toward the beginning of the night. The darker black line here is showing a normal circadian rhythm of cortisol, and we can see that if you completely sleep deprive the subjects, which is shown in the white squares here, yes, it reduces the, the full amplitude of the drop in cortisol, and the Height in cortisol after waking is persisted slightly longer, but it doesn't abolish the whole circadian nature of the cycle. On the other hand, some things look circadian, but in fact are a product of the sleep-wake cycle. So, um, for example, growth hormone release is like this. If you looked at the beginning of this graph, where... There's this big peak in growth hormone at the beginning of the night, and it's mostly low for the rest of the time. You might think that growth hormone release is circadian. But if you don't actually sleep at night, it turns out that that growth hormone release doesn't peak like that. It doesn't peak again until you are allowed to sleep. And it, it doesn't matter when that sleep happens, even if it's in the day, the peak will happen then. So, in fact, it's not a circadian rhythm, it's a sleep-wake, it's sleep-dependent. So, if you're really paying attention, you'll notice that this peak here in the first half of the night corresponds to when slow-wave sleep is the highest. And that's thought to be actually a causal dependency. Pulses of growth hormone come right after pulses of slow-wave sleep. And so, we think that growth hormone is directly dependent on slow wave sleep. And many processes are periodic in this daily pattern. Many tissues and organs and hormone releasing organs have their own rhythm with which to coordinate their action through circadian signals. So they take signals from the brain telling them where they are in the light dark cycle, but they but they will actually make their own cycles based on that. And so that means that if they get misaligned from strangely timed sleeping, for example, strangely timed activity or eating patterns, systems that used to be in sync with each other will get out of sync. So to take just a very simple example, if you create a circadian misalignment in subjects and give, give them breakfast at the same time with the same kind of food that you gave them when they were in alignment, the 
glucose and the insulin response will be much larger with a circadian misalignment than otherwise. So we'll add this to the graph. Circadian alignment can contribute to healthy glucose tolerance. 